Hi, Russ of Aquarimax here. Are desert darkling beetles the best pet invertebrates? Well, today, after a brief introduction to some representative species, we'll go into the housing and care, and then talk about the pros and cons of desert darkling beetles so you can come to your own conclusions. So let's get a representative sample of each species of beetle that I keep in here. This one here is Eleodes hispilabris. And this one is pretty active. It's not one of the bigger Eleodes species, but there are many that are smaller too. So it's a decent size. And this one is one that I can find locally, literally a few minutes walk from my house. And this much larger beetle is another one that I can find very close to my house. This is Eleodes obscurus. It is also known as the desert clown beetle, the desert stink beetle, and the pinacate beetle. And these guys are very active, and though they can produce a pretty strong smell, which gives them the name Desert Stink Beetle, they usually don't uh, do that unless they're feeling pretty threatened, and this one's not feeling threatened at the moment. I really like both the high activity levels and the hearty appetites that these contribute to my community of beetles. Now this is a cousin of the Blue Death Feigning Beetles, the rough death feigning beetle. You can see the slightly textured wing covers or elytrae from whence it gets its name. And these are underrated. Uh, they're not nearly as popular as the blue death feigning beetles, but they they have the same ability to feign death. And I think they're really cool. I got this one from Bugs in Cyberspace. Peter was kind enough to send this along with another order. And I was very excited to get it. Peter was also kind of smooth death feigning beetle, also known as the black death feigning beetle. As you can see, they do have a little bit of blue coloration as well, but they are much smoother. Their scientific name, in fact, their, their species name refers to that fact, Lavis meaning smooth. And these are especially adapted to living in sand dunes. And their death feigning act is especially amusing because they, they tend to twitch in kind of a funny manner. So thanks to Peter for sending me this one as well. And here is undoubtedly the most famous species of desert tenebrionid beetle, the blue death feigning beetle. I have several of these. If you haven't seen my playlist on the breeding project I'm doing with these, please check that out. I'm really excited. I have some larvae that are nearly ready to pupate. But these are fantastic. Both their texture and color are quite amazing. And if you haven't heard it, the color comes from a natural sunblock, kind of a waxy substance that the beetles um, secrete. So now that you've had a brief introduction to just a few of the possible species of desert darkling beetles that you could keep, let's talk about housing. You have a lot of options with housing because these beetles are very hardy and adaptable. If you wanted to go the really inexpensive route, you could use a plastic tub like this. A tub like this can run anywhere from maybe four to eight US dollars, a tub of this size. You wouldn't necessarily need to use a tub even uh, that big um, if you didn't have a very large number of beetles. You could use a smaller tub, like a six quart Sterilite tub, something like that. Uh, the beetles don't fly and they can't climb smooth surfaces. So if you don't have decor arranged in such a way that it would allow them to climb up and escape and you don't have to worry about pets or small children getting into the enclosure, you could just keep it with the lid off because the beetles are not going to escape. And uh, that would be fine as far as the beetles are concerned. If you do need a cover, you would probably want to ventilate it fairly well, put some holes in it because they, these beetles come from a fairly dry environment with decent ventilation, of course. If you want to go maybe a little bit more expensively and maybe more aesthetically pleasing route, then you could use something like this. These uh, animal carriers or, or critter keepers or whatever you call them are a pretty good option because there's built-in ventilation but also built-in protection for the beetles from inquisitive small children or from other pets or whatever. So something like this can be a really good option and the larger you get the more beetles you can keep in it. My preference is to use glass enclosures for my uh, beetle enclosures. Part of the reason is because aesthetically, uh, I think they give the best effect. 
Another reason is that you have more options in terms of lighting and heating that you can use. And those are usually optional in most situations, but we'll talk more about lighting and heating in a minute. And another one is that you can have very secure lids on them. Uh, many glass vivariums come with uh, very sturdy screens on top with locks and things like that. So they can be the safest option in terms of small children or other pets and things like that. I currently keep my blue death feigning beetle breeding colony in a 20 gallon long vivarium with a sliding screen lid. And I keep my other beetle community along with my velvet ants in uh, an enclosure that is designed for invertebrates specifically. And it has the same footprint approximately as a 10 gallon tank, but it is much lower in profile. And so it doesn't take up as much vertical space, but horizontally it fills up about the same space as a 10 gallon tank. And I really like the look of that and how it works for the beetles. So, like I said, you have options in terms of the enclosure. As far as substrate goes, one really easy option is just play sand. Play sand that has been generally washed and filtered before you buy it. It's inexpensive. Put an inch or two of that on the bottom of the enclosure, keep it dry, and that tends to work very well. There are other options, and if you're breeding them, you may want to get into some other things. But for just a general purpose substrate for your beetles, play sand works fine. Decor is important. A lot of these beetles will utilize the decor to climb on it a lot, and that's good. It's providing more surface area for the beetles and helps increase uh, you know, the visibility as they're doing interesting things in the enclosure uh, with the decor that you put in there. And it also serves as hides. It's important for the beetles to have places where they can hide in the dark and feel secure. So as you can see in this enclosure, I have some weathered sagebrush wood which provides climbing surfaces as well as hides, crevices, and things like that. I like to use the Choya uh, cactus skeletons as well. The beetles will hide inside them, they'll climb on them, and so on. And I've also got some rocks and things like that. But I also have a piece of cork bark with a cavity underneath it, and the beetles will hide in there as well. So lots of different options there. Just make sure that if you're using something like a rock or a, a stack of rocks, that it's not going to be something that's gonna to topple over and crush your beetles. And to come back to the cover, uh, this particular container has a very sturdy mesh lid with a little key that holds it shut. Um, and like I said, a lid is not strictly necessary if you're not worried about other animals or people getting into the enclosure but it's nice to have it there. And I like to use this because I also have velvet ants in the enclosure and they can climb glass. Now let's talk about lighting, heating, and temperature. Well, the good news is these beetles are really adaptable and the likelihood is that they are going to do well at any reasonable room temperature. If your house temperature is somewhere from the mid 60s to the mid 80s, the beetles are gonna be fine and they don't necessarily need heating. And that same goes for lighting. Ambient light is going to be enough for the beetles. However, these beetles bask when a basking spot is provided and it certainly doesn't hurt anything and it may help increase the activity of the beetles and certainly increases the visibility of the beetles. And so if you wanna put a light on your beetle enclosure, that can be beneficial. I like to use a light on mine uh, and I put a basking light of some kind, not too hot, you don't wanna produce a really hot area, but uh, for my blue death feigning beetles, uh, I just use a 50 watt light in a reptile bulb, a daylight reptile bulb. And for my uh, other enclosure, I'm just using a compact power fluorescent bulb, um, which produces a hot spot in there of about 85 degrees and the rest of the vivarium is about the mid 70s. And for my blue death feigning beetle enclosure, the hot spot is in the 90s and then the rest of the enclosure provides a temperature gradient. And the beetles do seem to seek out the light sometimes to bask. But as I said, it's not necessary. The beetles can thrive uh, and live long lives without anything but ambient light and temperature. So now it's time to cover feeding and hydration of your beetles. Again here, because all of these beetles are omnivorous, you have a lot of options. Now, as far as things that you find around the house, most vegetables and fruits are going to be eaten by many of these beetles. Uh, carrots, chopped 
baby organic carrots specifically is what many people use and that's what I use um, seem to be great. The chopping provides surfaces that allow the beetles to, to grip onto the, the edges of the carrots and kind of dig into them a little better than if you just give them a whole baby carrot. Uh, I also like to use chopped organic sweet potatoes. I give them pieces of apple, pieces of banana, zucchini, cucumber, mango, all different kinds of things in terms of fruits and vegetables that they will eat and that's not even a complete list. So many many options there. Some beetles will go more for uh, greenery. Certain beetles that I have, like my Eleotis obscurus, like uh, lettuce leaves. I'll give them romaine lettuce leaves and they will eat those, but the blue death fanning beetles don't seem to be very interested in that. So um, by providing a variety, you'll find things that your beetles like in terms of uh, vegetable matter. In terms of more proteinaceous fare, a lot of these beetles do uh, seek out protein, some of them even preferentially. Uh, blue death fanning beetles, in fact, uh, there was a study done on, on what they eat and over 60% of our diet, if I'm not wrong, uh, it consisted of dried insect material that they found uh, in the desert. So they do like a lot of protein and most of these beetles will go for, for proteinaceous food. Uh, some really easy ways to provide that are other types of pet food. Dog food and cat food, dry dog food and cat food are eaten very readily by many of these beetles. Uh, fish food pellets or flakes will be eaten by many of the beetles. I like to use dried river shrimp and I'll put a link in the description to where I bought these. They will eat these up. I just kind of break them up into pieces and they will nibble on those. So those are some protein sources. They'll also eat crickets. I breed crickets and so I'll put dead crickets from my cricket breeding colony in there and they will eat those as well. So you have a lot of options in terms of what you can offer as protein. And there are some other things you can offer as well. Beetle jelly. You can make your own beetle jelly. I have made a video on a beetle jelly that they will eat. All the ingredients are in the description to that video and the recipe is in the video so that you can make your own beetle jelly if you'd like to and that works really well but for convenience the food that I found that I like uh, the best in terms of convenience is definitely uh, commercial beetle jelly. In contrast to the homemade beetle jelly which needs to be kept in the refrigerator when it's not actually being fed uh, beetle jelly can be stored unopened outside of the refrigerator, has an incredibly long shelf life, is super easy to use. Once you open the container, if you're not going to use it all at once, you can put it in the fridge and it stores very well in the refrigerator for a long time. So for convenience, you really can't beat it. And it's also quite nutritious and there are different formulations, some with higher protein and things like that. They, they have the nutrients and they provide hydration for your beetles. So that kind of brings us to hydration. If you are offering uh, juicy vegetables like uh, baby carrots and sweet potatoes and or offering beetle jellies regularly, the beetles are going to get most or all of their uh, hydration requirements from those. You don't need to put a water dish in the enclosure and in fact uh, a lot of the beetles would avoid it. Some of the beetles might actually use it but it's not required to have a water dish. I think in terms of hydration other than the food you can spray part of the enclosure maybe once or twice a week. Uh, I will dampen part of the enclosure in my blue death fanning beetle uh, breeding setup, for example, once a week. And that seems to be perfectly adequate. You don't want to dampen the whole enclosure because low humidity is what these beetles tend to be used to. But some of these beetles will seek out that corner. If you missed part of the, the walls of the enclosure as well as the substrate, they'll seek out the droplets and lick them up. I've seen some of the beetles do that. Others of the beetles seem to get all of the water they need from their food and don't bother with that. But uh, that's about all you need to do in terms of hydration. So let's talk about the pros of keeping these beetles. First of all, I think it's kind of obvious by this point, these beetles are incredibly easy to take care of. Probably some of the easiest invertebrate pets that you can possibly own. You don't have to worry about going away for several days or even a week uh, when you're keeping these beetles. Just make sure you give them a good meal um, and some juicy vegetation of some kind before you leave and they'll be fine. Uh, a lot of these beetles can survive several weeks without food or water, but not that you'd want to subject them to that, but in, you know, it's, it demonstrates how easily they can be kept. Uh, another thing is that they're fairly long lived. Some of these uh, can live well over a decade. There are anecdotes of blue death fanning beetles, for example, living 17 years and many others living multiple years. And a lot of these beetles seem to have a long lifespan. Uh, we don't really know. I don't think it's, it's recorded 
you know, we don't have a lot of good records on uh, how long the lifespan is for many of these beetles, but it seems to be measured in years rather than, you know, part of a year or something like so many other invertebrate pets. So you can expect to have your beetles for quite a while if you take good care of them. And as you have seen already in the video, these beetles can be easily handled. They don't seem to bite, they, they don't scratch, they're, they're not so fast that they can't be easily managed while you're handling them, and they're kind of fun to handle in general. There is one con to handling them, and we'll talk about that when I get to the cons. I think one uh, area in which these beetles really shine is that they can be kept communally with lots of different species. And that is great in that you're going to get a large variety in terms of appearance of the beetles, in terms of activity times and activity levels. So there are some beetles that are most active right at dawn and dusk. There are other beetles that tend to be active you know, more throughout the day and, and different things like that. So the more types of beetles you mix, uh, the more visual interest you're going to get throughout the day, and they seem to get along very well together. And not only can you keep these beetles of different species together, you can actually keep them along with velvet ants, and I have done that quite a bit, and I really enjoy it because the velvet ants add some colors you're not going to see in the beetles, and a different type of activity, and it just makes for a really, really interesting uh, setup. Another advantage of these beetles is that many of the species will produce larvae in captivity and the code has been cracked for at least some of the species. Uh, trying to figure out how to get them to pupate was difficult, but now I am working on a captive breeding project with blue death fanning beetles and I'm not the first one to do that. Several people have succeeded in producing adult beetles and that's becoming more popular and I hope uh, that is becoming more popular with other species. For example, extra exotics is breeding Eleodes gorii and has a lot of larvae that are maturing. So hopefully we'll get a lot of these beetles in captivity to reproduce. And uh, I think the fact that there has been a resurgence in interest in, in getting these beetles to reproduce in captivity is great. And the fact that we're having success is even better. So now let's talk about the disadvantages of keeping desert darkling beetles in captivity. There really aren't a lot of them, but I did think of a few. One is that they're not widely bred in captivity yet, and so even though these beetles are very, very common uh, in their natural habitats, many of them are extremely common, uh, we do want to encourage captive breeding as much as possible. And although that is increasing, we're not to the point where we have a lot of captive bred beetles in captivity yet. So we're working on that, and so we're hoping in the future that won't be much of a con. Another one is that some of these beetles, not all of them, but some of them will secrete a repugnatorial fluid, much like millipedes will do when they are irritated. And in my experience, it very rarely uh, happens when you're handling the beetles. It's only happened to me once, and I'm not sure what set off that particular beetle, but uh, it released its repugnatorial fluid onto my hands. It's not as extremely disagreeable material. It doesn't stain your hands like a millipede repugnatorial fluid can. Uh, but you know you can smell it it's not a pleasant odor you wash it off it's not that big of a deal and like I said most of the time when I handle these beetles it does not happen and there are many of the beetle species that don't do it but the Eleode species uh, at least some of those will do it uh, when they feel particularly threatened and I don't know if this really fits in with the cons per se but it is important to keep in mind any regulations that are applicable to your situation in your area. Uh, just one specific example. I contacted APHIS and they said that if I collect these locally it's not a problem for them at all, but if I were to want to transport some of these Eleodes obscurus across uh, state lines then I would need to look into a permit. So just keep in mind that there may be regulations that you need to be aware of in your area. The only other real disadvantage I could think of is the activity levels of some of the beetles at certain times. If you want a pet that you're going to be able to see very active during the day, some of the beetles are less active during the day. Uh, in my experience, all of the species I have are active during the day, any, any time of the day potentially, but tend to be more active in the evening in general. But some species are you know, more active at other times. So I would say that uh, for maximum benefit, they are a beetle that you want to keep somewhere where you will see them in the evening, you know, afternoon and evening hours. Uh, if it's 
going to be in a place where you're only going to see them in the daytime. You, you will see less of them. You will still see some activity, but not quite as much. So part of that is overcome by mixing different species, like I mentioned before, and that will help with that. So that's really about it in terms of cons. They're really pretty amazing beetles. I have to take a moment to thank our Patreon backers. I really appreciate everything you do for the channel. It's going to be able to grow and do things that previously we hadn't even thought possible because of you. So thank you very much. And if you'd like to join the Aquarium X Pets Patreon family, I'll put a link at the end of the video as well as one in the description. So what do you think? Are desert darkling beetles the best pet invertebrates? I certainly think they're contenders. Let me know in the comments what you think. And thanks for watching today. I post videos every Wednesday and Friday, all on aquarium and vivarium pets. Please feel free to share, rate, comment. If you haven't already, subscribe. And then click the bell icon so you don't miss my next video. And if you'd like to learn more about possible candidates for the best pet invertebrates, check out my playlist right here. And here is the link to my Patreon page. Thanks again for watching.